All right, everyone. Welcome back to our next lecture. This is going to be a lecture on the nervous system. So we talked about the spine. Now let's talk about the nervous system of the body. And as always, if you like these videos, go ahead and subscribe to the channel, Twisted Science. Also, you can find my uh, Twisted Science channel on Patreon. So it's patreon.com slash Twisted Science if you'd like additional content there. So let's get into the central nervous system. So the nervous system functionality, we have our two main parts of it, the uh, central nervous system, as well as the peripheral nervous system. Central nervous system is everything comprising the brain and the spinal cord. Peripheral nervous system is everything out from there. Our neurological processes are going to be what control pretty much the entirety of our body. So it's going to get sensory information from the environment around us, as well as our organs. And it's going to receive that information so that we can process it and have an adequate response. We have not only interaction with our organs and with vital involuntary senses, but we also have the motor output that stimulates our muscles and glands that allow us to voluntarily move and respond to external stimuli. The two main types of cells that we have here are going to be neurons. Neurons are quite large. They're going to be stimuli uh, inducing cells, meaning that they're going to send electrical stimuluses down their axons into peripheral tissue. They're going to conduct those impulses via what are called neurotransmitters. And these are small molecules that are released at the ends of synaptic terminals and are going to bind to receptors on a distal end or a target tissue. There are also neuroglial cells, which are supportive cells. These are going to be of five different types. They're going to be much more numerous than neurons, and they're going to act like the tugboats to the large yacht or the freighter of the neuron. So for our sensory, uh, sensory system information, what we get is some type of signal. And that signal is going to be interpreted by a receptor. For instance, here we have the light that is going into the eye. The eye is going to sense the light that enters into it and is going to respond because of receptor induction. The receptor induction is going to send impulses back to the ophthalmic center of the brain, right? We are going to process those signals through the optic chiasm into the occipital lobe. Once we are able to process those signals, we are then going to consciously or uh, subconsciously respond to that signal and that is going to send an effect or some sort of effect or stimulus to an output reach. So if we're doing that in response to, let's say there's a light and we're going to go turn it off, all right, the light comes on, we sense that light come into our brain. Our brain senses that there is more light than we need. Our response is to get up and turn the light off. So as stated previously, we have the sensory central nervous system and the sensory peripheral nervous system. Central nervous system is the brain and spinal cord. Peripheral nervous system is going to be the parts of the body, all of uh, the rest of the central, uh, the rest of the peripheral nerves that extend from the spinal cord. So for our peripheral nervous system, we have to divide that into two sections. We have to have a section that's going to sense the information coming from the outside. That's the afferent signaling. We get afferent signals from nerves that are going to be extending up into the spinal cord in the brain. And then we have the efferent portion. The efferent portion is going to be the motor output. So this is going to create an effect. Think of efferent creating an effect, right? So we are affecting something. We are causing contraction. We're causing secretion. We're causing something in response to the signal that we have interpreted. Again, we have that sensory division, all right? That's going to be the afferent fibers. The afferent fibers are going to interpret sensory information. So they receive this information, send the impulses along the nerves, all right, from the peripheral nerves into the central, ner central nervous system for integration. Then our motor division or our motor output, this is going to be two uh, subdivisions of this. We get that effector, all right, remember effect, it's going to perform a motor function, going to send signals down this nerve tract to whatever type of muscle, gland, tissue that we're trying to affect. So our two subdivisions are somatic, which is going to be voluntary control. Somatic is usually going to be skeletal muscle involved. So this is how we move, how we interpret things and move in space around us. 
Autonomic is going to be involuntary. So autonomic is going to be things like increasing heart rate, things like blood vessel dilation, things like peristalsis of the intestines. This is going to be nerve input to the viscera, which is the vital organs of the body. This is an involuntary response. So this is the autonomic nervous system. Again, our central nervous system, we compose of the brain and spinal cord, our peripheral nervous system, we compose of the afferent and efferent divisions. Afferent is receiving sensory information from receptors such as the eye and the ear. The efferent is sending signals out from the central nervous system out either to skeletal muscle via the somatic nervous system or to glands, organs, muscles um, inside of uh, the, the visceral area. So we have the autonomic nervous system response here. Remember somatic is voluntary, autonomic, involuntary. Our first clinical application, talk about migraines, right? Migraines are going to be pretty common. We have about 12% of the US population suffers migraines on a regular basis. This is mostly due to environmental triggers. So something is going to cause overactivity of the brain, whether that be certain chemicals, uh, certain stressors, um, certain weather changes, barometric pressure changes, exposure to something around us or inside us is going to cause that triggering of a migraine. It's going to have roughly four to 72 hours, depending on severity and longevity. Um, it's indicated because of a period of increased responsiveness. So you have that stimulus, whatever happens, let's say a bright light shines in your face, you have a very quick stimulus that's going to cause a very large degree of excitation in the nerves. And as soon as that happens, it's followed by a period of unresponsiveness. And that means that the particular neurons that were stimulated, right, are now going to be unresponsive. And in particular neurons, that's going to cause pain sensation at the area of the base of the brain. So some therapeutic approaches to this, um, we can use pharmaceuticals such as triptans, uh, may curb migraines from onset. Um, so they, uh, they can be used, but they do cause blood vessel constriction. Um, uh, so they can be risky for some patient populations. There's also magnetic therapy or what is called transcranial magnetic stimulation. This can also be work, uh, used to try and treat migraines. This is similar to what a, a, an epileptic uh, seizure uh, type of treatment might be if you're trying to get that magnetic stimulation to alter the brain pathways or alter the nerve uh, conduction during that time period. Lower frequency chronic migraines, we can have things like Botox injections, which is botulinum. Uh, this is going to bind to neurotransmitters and cause dilation and inflammation in the blood vessels as a side effect of the indicated response. All right, so nervous tissue, looking at specifics of nerves. You have first the neuron. The neurons are going to be variable depending on their size and shape, right? We can have neurons that are a millimeter long. We can have neurons that are two feet long. They're going to be very different depending on the area of the body. All the neurons, however, are going to have the same shared structures, right? They're going to have a cell body, which is known as a soma or perikaryon. The soma contains the nucleus, the cytoplasm, all the organelles, which is mainly mitochondria, neurofilaments, and chromatophilic substances, which are known as nizzle bodies. They have small extensions from the soma known as dendrites. Those are receptive surfaces that are going to communicate with the area around the neuron. And then there is an axon, which is going to be the long tether that is going to transmit the electric impulse to a distant target, or it's going to take that impulse and move it from one cell to another. In the central portion of the soma, we have the axon hillock. This is going to be the area right before the axon arrives. So the axon hillock is going to be an uh, area at the center of the cell body right before we enter the axonal tract. It's where the communication from all inputs to that neuron comes together and either creates an action potential or does not. There are also collateral branches, which are secondary branches that come off of the axon as it's going down its track. So we have collaterals that are secondary branchings of the axon to other spaces. There's the terminal portion, 
of the axon, which is where the axon ends. This is going to have synaptic bulb, right? Which is also where the neurotransmitter is released. This is going to be where we have communication with the target area. Swan cells are going to be in the peripheral nervous system. And swan cells in the peripheral nervous system are going to create the myelin sheath or the myelin wrapping around neurons. So we see that in the neuroglia, right? This neuroglial cell specifically is in the per uh, peripheral nervous system only. And it's going to wrap around axons and create a myelin sheath. Myelin sheath is composed of myelin, which is a substance that is a mixture of fat and protein. The myelin sheath is going to coat the peripheral nervous system neurons and it's going to act as an electrical insulator, meaning that it will act to curb the electrical impulse. The electrical impulse will end up bouncing between them in areas known as nodes of Ronvier. Those are the gaps in between the areas of island wrapping, and that is where the nerve impulse is going to jump from space to space. So instead of going down the entire axon track, it's going to jump from node to node, avoiding those myelin wrapped areas and creating a much faster nerve conduction. So this is our common structure. Here we have the neuron in the center. So we see the nucleus there. We've also got nizzle bodies around here. Extending from that, we have dendrites, right? Going around this area here. At the bottom, we have the axon helix. So we see the uh, combination of all areas of this neuron into one area right here before we start out into the axon. And the axon hillock is where we're going to have all those signals come together and produce either a strong enough stimulus for an action potential or not. Then here we have the axon going down. We have it uh, wrapped by myelin. So this is myelin sheath wrapped all the way down here. We can see that this myelin sheath is created by the swan cell. We can see the leftover nucleus of the swan cell still here. The areas in between those myelin are the nodes of Ron VA. We see the nodes as we jump from node to node with the electrical impulse. This is a collateral branch coming off of here that's diverted from the main axon terminal. And then finally at the bottom, we see the synaptic knobs, which are going to be communicating with the distal end plates or the distal target tissue. All right, the myelin wrapping. Here we can see the myelination of this axon. Each one of these sections is wrapped by myelin sheath and one individual um, swan cell can wrap one individual area of axon. So we can see that it's been pushed to the edge, the swan cell nucleus. The rest of it is a tight myelin wrapping around the center of the axon here. So myelinated axons versus non-myelinated. Myelinated are going to be what are called saltatory conductive cells. So we see such a saltatory conduction, and that is going to increase the conduction speed for electrical impulses. In the peripheral nervous system, we have swan cells doing this. In the central nervous system, we have what are called oligodendrocytes. And the oligodendrocytes are going to produce the swan, or sorry, the uh, myelin wrapping around nerves in the central nervous system. Groups of the myelinated axons are going to what, be what makes the white matter. So in the spinal cord and in the central nervous system in the brain, uh, we have white matter and gray matter. And the white matter is axon tracks that are myelinated. Unmyelinated axons are going to be much slower in their conduction speed. In the central nervous system, um, they're going to compose the gray matter. Uh, this is going to be on the outer portion of the cerebrum and in the inner portion of the spinal cord. In the peripheral nervous system, these are going to be um, axons that are encased by a swan cell, but there's not going to be any wrapping of myelin around the surrounding axon. So there's not actually going to be a wrapping of myelin around it. So here we can see a myelinated axon, right? We have the myelin sheath wrapping around this area here, large amount of layering of myelin. And then down at the bottom, we have an unmyelinated axon. See, there's no centralized portion of uh, myelin wrapping here. It's simply encased by a swan cell, but there's nothing wrapped. All right, another clinical application is multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is actually degradation of the myelin sheath. So we have the myelin that is actually going to be attacked in an autoimmune response. 
Once we attack this myelin on the axon, it's going to actually form what are called scleroses or scars. <clears throat> and these are going to degrade the neuron and stop it from sending impulses. So what ends up happening is that we are going to have dysfunction and dysfunction is going to take place in the motor neurons. So we're going to have issues with contraction. We're going to have issues with movement, with stability. Um, there's going to be muscle atrophying that goes on. So you're going to have issues with being able to move and sustain yourself physically. So we classify neurons by their structure. The most common is the traditional multipolar neuron, which we saw in the image earlier in the slides. You have many processes extending from the cell body. Um, that is going to be several dendrites that extend there, but there's only one axon. So we only have one axon present, even though we have multiple dendrites extending from it. This is pretty much all of the neurons that exist in the central nervous system and some of them in the autonomic nervous system. Then we have bipolar neurons. Bipolar neurons are going to extend from the cell body with one uh, axon in one direction and one dendrite in the other. They're not that common. We do see them in the retinal layer of the eyes. Uh, we do see them in the ears and the nose. Then we have unipolar, which are going to be cell bodies that have one process. There's two branches of that one process. So it has a branch that goes uh, to one direction and a branch that goes to the other, but they are actually just the same axon functioning in the uh, peripheral branch versus the central branch. All right, so here's your traditional multipolar neuron. See the cell body here with our dendritic spines. The impulse is going to be running down the axon, all right, down to the synaptic bulbs here, synaptic terminals. Then we have a bipolar neuron. Here we see the central portion of the cell body of the soma. We're extending down this way through an axon and we're extending the other direction except for we have a dendrite here. So we have two extensions, one being an axon, one being a dendrite. Finally, we have a unipolar. The unipolar has the cell body off center. So here we see cell body. Then we have one continuous axon with two branches, a branch that goes down this way and one that goes up this way. That axon is going to have a peripheral process, which is going to get signals from the peripheral nervous system. And it has a central process, which is going to take that sensory information and move it into the central nervous system. We can also classify neurons by their functionality. So neurons can be classified as afferent or sensory. Remember afferent versus efferent. Efferent has an effect. Sensory afferent neurons are going to take impulses from the periphery to the central nervous system. Most of them are going to be unipolar. Then we have interneurons, which are mostly located in the central nervous system, especially in the spinal cord and in the area of the brainstem. We're going to link neurons together with this, which is why they are named interneurons or between neurons. They relay information from one part of the central nervous system to another. Then we have the motor or efferent neurons going to carry our impulses from the central nervous system out to muscles or tissues. Most of them are multipolar. In the somatic nervous system, we have control of skeletal muscle. In the autonomic, we're going to control the involuntary smooth and cardiac muscle as well as glands. So we get a sensory receptor input from the peripheral nervous system. We're going to integrate that into the spinal cord in the central nervous system via interneurons. An interneuron can either exist as one or two, and we can then send that processing signal up to the motor neuron in the central nervous system, which will then send output through the efferent pathway of the motor neuron to whatever it is affecting. All right, general functions of our neuroglial cells. Again, we have five of those. We're going to provide structural support. We're going to guide neurons into position, especially in embryonic development. Going to produce growth factors for neurons to remove excess ions and neurotransmitters. And we also aid in synapse formation. So a couple of different types here. Number one is the astrocyte. The astrocyte is a big regulator of the blood-brain barrier. 
It's going to connect neurons to blood vessels. It's going to aid in the metabolism of certain things as well as regulate ion concentrations. So it's going to allow certain substances in, such as potassium, to keep other things out. Next is oligodendrocytes. This is going to be the central nervous system myelinating cell. Microglia, these are going to work as the resident immune cells of the central nervous system. These are phag phagocytic cells, which means cellular eating. They're going to provide immune functionality as well as structural support. Next is our ependymal cells. Ependymal cells are extremely important in making cerebrospinal fluid. So they're gonna line the cavities of the spinal cord and the ventricles and covering the choroid plexuses. They produce cerebrospinal fluid and they are ciliated cuboidal or columnar in nature. So here we see a couple of the different ones. See an astrocyte has the foot processes or podocytes that are going to be attached to the capillary on one side, attached to the neuron on the other. Again, regulating blood brain barrier as well as communication between the blood and the neuron. We see the ependymal cells up here facing this open cavity space producing cerebrospinal fluid. We see the microglia here going to roam around and ingest excess debris, ions, and waste uh, to get rid of them. We see an oligodendrocyte over here. Again, it is myelinating multiple regions of an axon on either side, and this is in the central nervous system. In the peripheral nervous system, these would be swan cells. Notice how a swan cell can only myelinate one section of a neuron at a time, whereas the oligodendrocytes can uh, myelinate multiple sections of different neurons. So in the peripheral nervous system, we have the two neuroglial cells of the swan cell and the satellite cell. Swan cells produce the myelin sheath. Satellite cells are going to work to support, nourish, and balance ionic concentrations. So a slight summary of this. Our astrocytes are star-shaped. They're going to provide support, form scar tissue, transport substances for the blood-brain barrier, communicate with other neurons, and mock, uh, mop up the excess ions and induce synapse formation. Our oligodendrocytes, uh, they're shaped similar to astrocytes, uh, but with fewer processes going to form the myelin sheath in the central nervous system. Microglia, these are the smallest of the, of the uh, neuroglial cells. Uh, they're gonna provide structural support as well as phagocytosis and immune functionality. The ependymal cells, these are going to line the cavities of the ventricles in the central spinal cord. They are cuboidal and columnar, ciliated in nature. We're going to form that porous layer and it's going to produce cerebrospinal fluid as well as allow substances to diffuse between the interstitial fluid and the brain and spinal cord. Peripheral nervous system, we have the swan cell, which is going to be very abundant in this uh, peripheral nervous system. It is there to form myelin sheath around the axons. And we finally have satellite cells, which are going to be small cuboidal cells. They're going to support the glia, right? Support the ganglia and mop up excess ions. Mature neurons are going to exist that way until they die. So mature neurons do not divide, they do not replicate. So if the cell body of a neuron is injured, usually the neuron does not regenerate. The neuron regeneration in the peripheral nervous system is limited, but it is a little bit better than the neuron regeneration in the central nervous system. In the peripheral nervous system, it may still be able to regenerate. So the axon separated from the cell body. If the axon is damaged, the myelin sheath might be able to uh, regenerate around it. The swan cells in the neural lemma of those axons remain even after damage. So the swan cells can produce what is called a guiding sheath for an axon to grow back again. In the neuro, uh, central nervous system, the axons lack a neural lemma, so we don't have the ability to form a guiding sheath. So that means that we don't have oligodendrocyte proliferation after injury, so there is no myelination and regeneration is unlikely. So here we have a peripheral nervous system degeneration, right? The site of injury at the midline of the axon here. The swan cells in the neural lemma are still intact. So even though they're damaged and cut off from the initial segment of the neuron, we still have the ability to regenerate them because the swan cell is still there. So the swan cell tube 
extends all right, after injury, and the swan cells can then form new myelin sheath as that axon reestablishes a connection. All right, cell membrane potentials. Cell membrane is electrically charged. We have a charge difference in a low, uh, local area, and that's called a polarity. This is because of ion distribution, so mainly the distribution of things like sodium and potassium. It's very important in conduction of nerve impulses and in excitability of tissue. A membrane potential is going to exist at all times. This is going to be the charge inside of a cell. So it's, uh, it's basically the uh, potential of energy to transport charges across a membrane. All cells are going to have a resting membrane potential, and the resting membrane potential is going to be, depending on where we are, an average of about negative 70 millivolts. If we have unequal ion distribution, however, let's say we have potassium ion concentration that's much higher than normal. If we have unequal distribution, potassium ions are in higher concentration inside of the cell than outside of the cell. That is going to be um, the usual. Sodium ions are higher concentration outside of the cell than inside of the cell, right? Negativity inside of the cell is mainly due to large numbers of the negatively charged impermeant proteins like phosphate and sulfate. So that gradient is going to be what is allowing for excitability. The gradient between sodium and potassium outside and inside of the cell is going to establish that negative 70 millivolt resting membrane potential so that we can now have the potentially uh, to the potential to be excited by an electrical current. So what mainly establishes this gradient is the sodium-potassium pump, right? Sodium-potassium ions, if they follow the rules of diffusion with no other input, would actually be the opposite of what they are. Because right now, all the sodium is going to be outside of the cell. If it was allowed to diffuse normally, then it would equilibrize, and there would be an equal amount of sodium inside of the cell and outside. But since that is not able to do that, the sodium potassium pump is constantly pushing sodium and potassium against their concentration gradients. We have the establishment of the resting membrane potential. So sodium potassium pump pumps three sodium ions out for every two potassium ions it lets in. This is a direct primary transport mechanism. It is active transport, meaning that it uses ATP because we are pushing these ions against their concentration gradients. When we get an action potential, an action potential is the ability to send a nerve impulse down a tract. So we see the sequence of electrical events in an excitable cell. We have to change the resting membrane potential. We have to make it go up positively until it reaches a threshold. Once it reaches a threshold, then it is able to elicit an action potential. The action potentials are going to be what is communicating from cell to cell down the axon. Here's an example of an ion channel. <clears throat> in this case, on the left side, the channel is closed. In this case, on the right side, the channel is open. All right, so conditions leading to resting membrane potential. So this neuron, you see, has a normal uh, concentration, which is high sodium outside of the cell and low sodium inside. So normally, sodium would go ahead and diffuse across this membrane into the cell body. Now we have a high concentration of potassium inside and low concentration of potassium outside. So normally we would have diffusion of potassium from inside of the cell to outside of the cell. The pump is going to maintain an opposite gradient. So instead of having transport from high to low, now the pump is moving sodium from low to high. So we're actually going against that concentration gradient of what diffusion would be like. Same thing here, okay? For potassium, we are going against the concentration gradient. Instead of pumping it out, we're going to be pumping it in, maintaining that differentiation. So there's slightly more sodium ions entering the cell than potassium ions that leave it. The sodium potassium pump balances the movements that go on here. So the ion concentrations are maintained and therefore, we still have a negative 70 millivolt action potential. This is what a normal action potential looks like. So a normal action potential 
is going to have a resting membrane potential down here of about negative 70. We're going to reach threshold at about negative 55. Once we reach threshold, we go directly into a depolarization, which shoots us up to about a positive 30 millivolt uh, reach at the peak. Then we immediately have a repolarization that occurs to knock it back down all the way to under the resting membrane potential slightly until it recovers and gets reestablished at this negative 70 millivolt time frame. So local potential changes and action potentials. Neurons are excitable and any stimulus is going to be anything that changes the resting membrane potential from where it is. So it doesn't matter if the resting membrane potential changes from negative 70 to negative 90, that is still a stimulus even though it became more negative. An excitatory stimulus that reaches threshold is then going to be able to open chemically gated sodium channels. And once those chemically gated sodium channels open, now we have the ability to depolarize the membrane. A local potential change is going to be a change in the membrane potential that occurs only at the area of stimulation. So we have what is called a graded potential here. The greater the stimulus, the greater the potential change. If we get a local potential and it's not strong enough to reach threshold, it is going to be known as a sub-threshold stimulus. If we get a sub-threshold stimulus, we'll get excitation of that area, but we're not going to be able to get an active potential from it. So we just have a localized stimulus that doesn't go anywhere. If, however, we have graded stimuli that are subsequent or frequent or are increasing in strength, we can potentially reach a threshold. So if you add them up together, uh, put the conglomeration of threshold uh, reaching stimuli together, we can get an action potential from that. So for example, if we have a membrane change here, right? we have some sort of a stimulus that changed it from negative 70 to negative 62 millivolts. As far as this is concerned, we have a localized potential. So we get to a sub-threshold stimulus. We got to a sub-threshold stimulus, but we did not reach threshold. However, in this case, we do. So we go from negative 70 millivolts. Now we have a stimulus that pushes us up to negative 55 millivolts. At negative 55 millivolts, we reach threshold. And as soon as we reach threshold, then we go up into depolarization. So as soon as we reach that threshold, <coughs> it's going to immediately open those sodium channels, and we're going to cause what is called excitation of the trigger zone. That allows for an action potential to move forward. So to define this, a threshold stimulus is going to be a stimulus that reaches threshold potential, which is going to be sitting at negative 55. At that time, we have voltage-gated sodium channels that will open immediately. And all of a sudden, that charge differentiation flips from negative 55 to positive 30 and that is going to be an all or none response. That negative, 30, or negative 55 to positive 30 is known as a depolarization. So this is where we change from a negative to positive charge inside of the cell. The all or none response means that if we get to threshold, an action potential is happening, okay? If it's happening, it's gonna go all the way. If it's not, then it's not gonna do anything. So either we reach the action potential and it goes all the way or nothing happens. Repolarization is what happens after we have the membrane potential change to a positive. Once we reach that positive, we have to quickly reestablish the resting membrane potential or else we'll have overstimulation of that neuron tract. So at repolarization, this is where we have potassium channels open. And as soon as that happens, potassium channels will allow for potassium ions to rush out of the cell and we reestablish polarity. So we repolarize the membrane. When we have repolarization, we go into a slight period of hyperpolarization, which is where we have a slight overshoot of the repolarization process. So the potential drops below negative 70 millivolts for a short moment. That's because the potassium channels are slower to close than the sodium channels are. So they actually allow too much potassium to move through and that creates a hyperpolarization. So here we see we have nothing going on, all right? At this point, however, we have 
uh, some sort of an action potential threshold stimulus is reached. And once that happens, we start to push it and we push it up. So the sodium channels open up. So we depolarize the membrane. During depolarization, until we get to the peak, the potassium channels are closed. Then once we reach the peak and we're at positive 30 millivolts after depolarization, at that point, the potassium channel is open and the sodium channel is closed, which allows for potassium to repolarize the membrane. So events leading to impulse conduction. Number one, cell membrane has to establish a resting potential by the sodium potassium pump. At negative 70 millivolts. Now, if the neuron receives a stimulation, if it's strong enough to reach the trigger zone to cause the axon to open, that's great. If not, it will just be a subthreshold localized stimulus that only acts on the area of stimulus. So the sodium channels will open, sodium ions diffuse and depolarize the membrane. As soon as depolarization happens and we get to positive 30 millivolts, those potassium channels now open and the potassium channels flood outward. That will repolarize the membrane. So we have repolarization. The action potential will cause that electrical current to go all the way down the axon to wherever the distal target is. All right, during an action potential, the, uh, there is two sections that we have to discuss as far as repeat or uh, continuous recurrence of an action potential. Number one is the absolute refractory period. This is where it doesn't matter how strong of a stimulus you have, the next action potential will not happen. So the threshold stimulus will not be able to generate another action potential. The voltage-gated sodium channels are actually unresponsive during this time. During the relative refractory period, this is where we have the ability to create another action potential, but you have to have a stimulus that is extreme, right? You have to have a very high intensity stimulus to generate another action potential at this point. Repolarization is not complete. So you're either in very uh, high area for resting uh, membrane potential, like negative 55, negative 60 area, or you're in hyperpolarization, or you're in negative 75, negative 80 millivolt region. So the refractory periods are there as a fail safe so that we can't have just continuous nerve impulses going uh, over and over again forever. So we have to have a slight period or small period after an action potential um, that is refractory so that we can only generate so many action potentials per second. Speed of nerve impulses is due to myelination. Unmyelinated axons uh, conduct impulses much slower because they have to go through each fiber uh, section, uh, whereas myelinated axons, they have the impulses jump from node to node, right? So the ions move across the membrane at the gaps in between the myelin sheath. That conduction is known as saltatory conduction, as I stated previously. Saltatory conduction is much faster than our unmyelinated conduction. Something else affecting speed is going to be the diameter of the axon. Large axons conduct uh, signals much faster than smaller axons do. So for example, a thick myelinated axon could send a signal upwards of 120 meters per second in its speed. Uh, which is extremely fast, whereas a, a thinner unmyelinated axon could potentially only be half a meter per second. So this is our action potential propagation, right? Here we have a threshold stimulus that's been reached. All of a sudden, the sodium channels open. They flood inward. We have depolarization of the membrane. Then as soon as we do that, we're going to keep jumping. So we're going to go to the next section, depolarize that section. And we're going to go to the next section, depolarize that section. So it's going to depolarize each section as we move down. Here we have saltatory conduction. So instead of having to depolarize every section of the axon as we move down the axon, we can just jump. We can go between the, the myelin sheath wrappings from the Schwann cells to each node. And we don't have to go through that section that is covered by the myelin. So we can just jump from node to node and conduct that action potential down the axon. All right, factors affecting our impulse conduction. Basically, ion concentrations are what are going to be the dictator here. So if we increase potassium in the extracellular fluid, this means that our threshold potential is going to be reached with a lower sti uh, stimulus. Uh, so we can lead to excitable neurons here. 
if you decrease concentration of potassium in the extracellular fluid. Here you have the opposite happening. When those potassium channels open during repolarization, the speed is going to be much slower because we have much less uh, concentration to deal with. So that means that neurons can now become hyperpolarized and action potentials are actually not able to be generated as easily. If we have a decrease in the permeability to potassium ions, here if we have potassium ions that are not permeable or lack permeability, uh, we can stop impulses from passing through tissue. If that is the case, then impulses could potentially not reach the brain and we can have a lack of sensation. So things like touch and pain and pressure could be negated. We may not be able to sense them as easily. So neurons communicate at the synapse. We have a presynaptic cell that's going to send an impulse. We have a postsynaptic cell that's going to receive it. And there's a synaptic cleft that exists in between the two neurons. Synaptic transmission is that movement of neurotransmitter from one axon to the other across the synaptic cleft onto the receptors, all right? We transfer information of the stimulus by, via the neurotransmitters. So here we have a direction of impulse down this axon from the primary nerve. As soon as we get to the dendrite formation of the secondary nerve, we have an axon, right? We have an axon terminal here with the bulb. This axon terminal bulb is going to be in contact with this dendrite from this neuron. And at that point, we have the neurotransmitter being extruded and sent across the synaptic cleft to now be attached to receptors on the dendritic surface. So this small graphic shows us we have presynaptic signaling of impulse down the axon. We then reach the end bulb, the terminal bulb. We have neurotransmitter passage across the synaptic cleft attaching to that postsynaptic neuron. And now we can continue to send the nerve impulse and conduct it down another axon track. All right here we have the synapse. We can see the direction of impulse coming in. As soon as we enter in, we have stimulus that is now excited this area. So excitatory area here, we have influx of calcium. That influx of calcium is going to bind to the vesicles and allow for the vesicles to extrude. So as soon as we have the vesicle attached to this synaptic end bulb, we have the neurotransmitter that is now being released out into the synaptic cleft. As it is released, it is either gonna do one or two things. It's going to be degraded by the enzyme inside of the synaptic cleft area, or it's going to attach to the receptor on the postsynaptic uh, neuron uh, here to send the signal down. So here's our micrograph of that. We have a uh, area of a synaptic bulb, all right? So we see a bunch of synaptic vesicles in here ready to go across. We have the synaptic cleft and the postsynaptic membrane. So those synaptic vesicles are gonna release neurotransmitter across here and attach to our postsynaptic cell. So postsynaptic transmission, we have release of neurotransmitters across that synaptic cleft, and they're going to attach to those receptors on the post membrane, uh, postsynaptic cell membrane. Excitatory neurotransmitters are going to be those that increase the permeability to sodium. So they're going to allow for the membrane to be closer to threshold. Inhibitory neurotransmitters are going to move that membrane away from threshold or further away. So it's going to decrease the likelihood of impulses. So then we have localized potentials. Localized potentials are going to either be excitatory or inhibitory. And these are known as EPSPs or IPSPs. <clears throat> An EPSP is where we have a membrane change, right? The neurotransmitter is going to open up uh, sodium channels, so it's going to slightly depolarize the membrane. As we get EPSPs rolling in more and more, it gets closer and closer to the threshold until we reach a stimulus that reaches threshold and we can go forward with an active potential. Each time we have an EPSP, the action potential from the postsynaptic cell is more likely. The opposite is occurring for the IPSP. The IPSP is going to make the membrane uh, more permeable to potassium. So that is going to be either potassium or chloride. And as soon as that happens, 
it's going to hyperpolarize the membrane. And hyperpolarization, of course, is taking us further away from the threshold stimulus, which is going to decrease the likelihood of an action potential. If we're going to get an action potential, we have to weigh the EPSPs and IPSPs out. That means that the EPSPs and IPSPs are added together in a process called summation. If it is a net excitatory effect, it has to reach threshold or else we're not going to get an action potential. If there is a net inhibitory effect, of course, we are going to be further away from threshold than we normally would be, which is going to be uh, very conducive to inhibiting uh, generation of action potentials. So here's an excitatory and inhibitory stimuli. An excitatory stimuli is going to take us up further towards threshold stimulus. So here we have a small depolarization. An inhibitory stimulus is going to be one that's going to take us further from the threshold. So we have a small dip here. We go to negative 75 millivolts or so. Each one of these nerve signalings or each one of these axon tables um, of bulbs are going to send either an EPSP or an IPSP to this neuron. So each one of these synaptic bulbs are going to release neurotransmitter and that can either be an excitatory stimulus or an inhibitory stimulus. Speaking of neurotransmitters, we see neurotransmitters active in all neurons, all right? We have almost 100 different types. Uh, some of them are much, much more uh, frequently used than others. For example, acetylcholine is an extremely common one that we see in all skeletal muscle contraction. Some classifications of neurotransmitters, they can be monoamines, they could be amino acids, such as glutamate uh, or GABA, which is glutaminobutyric acid. Uh, we can have peptides. Uh, they can be produced in the rough endoplasmic reticulum by ribosomes or to the cytoplasm. Um, when our impulses reach the synaptic knobs on axons, this is where we get vesicular transport of neurotransmitters out by exocytosis. So we see endocytosis returning the membrane to the cytoplasm, forming new vesicles. We're extruding neurotransmitter out of the membrane by vesicular release. And that is known as vesicular trafficking. So here are some common neurotransmitters that we see. Number one, acetylcholine. From the central nervous system, it controls skeletal muscle actions. In the peripheral nervous system, it's going to stimulate the skeletal muscle contraction at the neuromuscular junction. Norepinephrine, this is a biogenic amine. It's going to create a sense of well-being and lower levels of depression. Okay? In the peripheral nervous system, it could excite or inhibit autonomic responses depending on where we are, depending on the receptor. Dopamine, in the central nervous system, this is going to be another... Uh, feel good chemical, we have a sense of well-being. Uh, deficiency, especially in the substantia nigra pars compacta uh, of the geniculate nucleus is going to be uh, associated with generation of Parkinson's disease. In the peripheral nervous system, we see that its actions are somewhat limited. Uh, it could cause excitation or inhibition depending on the receptor type. Serotonin in the central nervous system is going to be primarily inhibitory. Uh, They've heard of serotonin as a sleep chemical or something that can be stimulatory to cause drowsiness, uh, uh, drowsiness and fatigue. Um, its action is blocked by LSD uh, drug use and is, of course, enhanced by SSRIs or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Histamine. Histamine is going to work in the central nervous system on the hypothalamus to promote alertness. For amino acids, we have GABA and glycine. Uh, GABA and glycine are generally inhibitory. And then we have glutamate, which glutamate is generally excitatory, and it is the most abundant excitatory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. We have neuropeptides, which are peptides that are assistant. All right, They're not going to be direct, but they are going to be indirectly uh, helping the process. Here we have enkephalins and endorphins in the central nervous system. These are generally going to reduce pain signaling, um, and they do so by inhibiting substance P release, which substance P is a neuropeptide acting in the peripheral nervous system, which is excitatory and especially works on perception of pain. Uh, 
For gases, nitric oxide in the central nervous system, this could potentially heighten memory formation, especially during times of stress. And in the peripheral nervous system, nitric oxide is a vasodilator. So here are some disorders and how they associate with uh, neurotransmitter imbalances. We have things like depression, epilepsy, Huntington's disease, hypersomnia, which is too much sleeping, insomnia, inability to sleep, mania, Parkinson's disease, schizophrenia, and tardive dyskinesia. All right, clinical depression. Um, this could be due to serotonin. We see SSRIs used a lot here. Epilepsy, this could be excessive GABA, leading to excessive norepinephrine or dopamine. Huntington's disease is deficiency of GABA. Hypersomnia is excess serotonin. Insomnia is deficiency of serotonin. Mania is excess norepinephrine. Parkinson's disease, dopamine deficiency. Schizophrenia could be deficient GABA, uh, leading to an excess of dopamine. And then tardive dyskinesia is usually a byproduct of Parkinson's disease, again, coming from deficient dopamine. Here are some drugs that alter our neurotransmitter levels. All right, we have tryptophan, we have zirpine, uh, reserpine, we have curare, uh, we have valium, nicotine, cocaine, uh, tricyclics, such as amitriptyline, uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, or MOIAs. Uh, let's see. Selective serotonin, so SSRIs, and dual reuptake inhibitors, which can act on both serotonin and norepinephrine. So a lot of different drugs here. Uh, tryptophan works on serotonin. Reserpine works on norepinephrine. Curare works on acetylcholine. Have to be a little bit um, careful with curare because it can easily uh, be overdosed on. And if it's overdosed on, it can lead to paralysis of respiratory muscles and cardiac muscle, uh, which could lead to death, of course. So you have to make sure that your dosage is, is very, very well controlled there. Valium works on GABA, nicotine, acetylcholine, and dopamine. Uh, cocaine, dopamine, tricyclics are uh, norepinephrine and serotonin. Monoamine oxidase is norepinephrine, SSRI is serotonin, and dual reuptake serotonin and norepinephrine. So our events leading to neurotransmitter release. We have an action potential that goes along the axon and over the surface of the bulb. At the synaptic knob, we have calcium ions that are infused inward. And the presence of those calcium ions, as I stated before, the calcium ions will bind to the synaptic vesicles and lead to that vesicular trafficking of neurotransmitter. As soon as that neurotransmitter is extruded by exocytosis into the synaptic cleft, it will then go into the receptor on the other side. So the synaptic vesicle becomes part of the cell membrane and the added membrane provides material for endocytotic vesicles again. All right, neurotransmitters. Classification, neuro, uh, neuropeptide, right? Neuropeptides are going to act as neuromodulators in most cases. So they're going to be assistant um, compounds to main neurotransmitters. So we see enkephalins, again, relieving pain sensation. There's beta endorphin, which is going to act similarly to enkephalins, uh, but it is the chronic long-term form of this. Substance P, which is found in neurons, conducting pain impulses, um, endorphins and enkephalins both will inhibit the release of this substance. All right, usually uh, drugs are going to be a big, big thing with this. Neurotransmitter modification is a, a huge uh, pharmaceutical target. Uh, number one would be opiates. Um, opiates are going to produce uh, exogenous source for endorphins. So when you take an opiate, it's automatically going to bind to those endorphin receptors and mitigate the feelings of pain. Um, so they're very useful in release from pain, uh, but they're also very addictive and they have a lot of bad side effects and issues like uh, gastrointestinal upset, constipation, drowsiness, fatigue, uh, develop dependency pretty easily. Um, so this is because your body stops producing its own endorphins at this time because the receptors are constantly bound. So your body thinks that you don't need them anymore because you have the receptors bound at all times. So you're not able to do that. Um, so when the drug is stopped, 
obviously your person uh, is not going to be able to produce their own endorphins at that time. So they're going to have a period of withdrawal and uh, it's, it's going to be pretty bad uh, for a period of time. And the severity of that withdrawal is pretty much dependent on how much and how long the person abused opiates for. All right. Let's see. Next is nerve impulses. Um, nervous system processes nerve impulses and reflects the organization of the neurons. So when we look at impulses, we have like structures producing the same type of thing. All right. These are known as neuronal pools. We have groups of inner neurons that work in the same pathway. Next is facilitation. Facilitation, again, is repeated impulses on an excitatory presynaptic neuron. This is going to increase the likelihood that a postsynaptic cell will reach threshold. Convergence, this is just what it sounds like. Convergence is where we have input onto one neuron from a lot of different signals. So we see a conglomeration or a summation of signals from many different neurons onto one target. So it makes it possible for a neuron to uh, create a summation of, uh, a approach to impulses um, to get to threshold descent and action potential. Then we have divergence, which is the opposite of convergence. We see that the neuron will send impulses out to several neurons. So one neuron will send its impulse to many different neurons at the same time via those collateral branches on the axon, right? So an impulse from a single neuron may activate several different motor units in a skeletal muscle, for example. All right, so here we have example of convergence on the left side. You see the signals from two separate neurons are converging on one down here. And we have divergence over here. So the signal from this neuron is split and collateral branches of this axon to two separate neurons as a target. All right, so for drug addiction, when we're talking about drug addiction, you have to talk about what is working and what is not. So what is working is the antagonist. That's the drug that binds to a receptor and actively blocks the neurotransmitter. What's not working is an agonist. So that means that the drug is going to activate a receptor and cause an action potential or uh, aiding the binding of a neurotransmitter. So that's going to be the opposite of the antagonist. Some things that are pretty easy to become addicted to are things like amphetamines, uh, which increases norepinephrine activity, nicotine, uh, which is binding to nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, um, leading to dopamine release and feelings of well being. All righty. Well, that was our central nervous system production. And I hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Don't forget to subscribe and go to the Patreon if you have not. And I will see you for our next lecture video. Peace.